Welcome back to the Everyday Insights Podcast. I know it's been a while, but after a refreshing hiatus, I'm thrilled to jump back in and share more insightful conversations with you. Today's guest is my friend, Brett Cassidy. Not only is he an intrepid outdoor adventurer, but he's also a dedicated father who has spent the last five years raising his two lovely children full time. Stay tuned for riveting tales from his five month trek hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, including a couple of heart stopping adventures you don't want to miss. Plus, we'll dive into his life tips on mastering the art of fatherhood and learn how buying a van bridged the gap between his need for adventure and crafting cherished memories with his family. As always, please like, subscribe, or comment on whatever platform you're tuning in from. And if something resonates with you during our chat, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. And with that, let's dive right in. All right, well, welcome, Brett. Thank you for joining today. It's uh, Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, we met like a year ago, you said, over at the uh, Pacific Crest? Pacific Crest Relay? Cascade Lakes. Cascade Lakes. Yes. That's it. I got all we, these names. We met in the Mount, Mount Bachelor parking area. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like very all, briefly, right? Yeah. Very briefly toward the very end of the race. So that was, that was our tiny meeting. And then last, or about a month ago, no, three weeks ago, about three weeks ago, we ran a big, big run together around uh, Mount Hood. That yes. was pretty intense. We did this about 40 mile uh, trek, death march, or. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd call it a mountain run. <laughs> 40 mile mountain run. That was a yeah. good time. <laughs> right. It's like a lot of walking, but it's definitely running. We were yeah. trying to run as much as possible. Right. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. According, according to my Garmin, it was about 40% running, 60% yeah. hiking. So that's a pretty good percentage for, yeah. for that type of terrain. I think. Is it? Okay. Good. I think so. Yeah. It felt, felt like not enough running to me in a way, but it was also like as much as I could do. Yeah. Or as much, Just <laughs> as need as to do more do. training then, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you got to keep everybody together too. I think mm. that was... You know, we went with five guys and you know, not everybody's the same fitness level or we we're close, not not too far off. But yeah. uh, it was interesting to see the differences, though. I could not run after 28 miles. I was my running muscles were done. Yeah. Ethan was fine. Like when it flattened out, he could just keep going. It was yeah. interesting to see the difference between Ethan and myself. Yeah. In terms of the that that training. Yeah. Yeah. I've been running for a year and a half now for training for all this you know, marathon, ultra marathon distance stuff. Mm -hmm. And I've been running a lot longer than that in my life, but I just meant, you know, I've been in shape and doing this for a bit and I'm still not getting there, which is the weird part. Maybe it's my age or whatever, but at 20 miles or so, my body is just kind of tanking off. Yeah. And do you do any strength training? No, I need to get into that. Yeah. You think? I think that's the difference. I think that will be a big level up if I, yeah. Just start doing some squats and lifting weights or upper body stuff too. Even, I don't know. Yeah. I don't do any either. And I'm, I'm thinking about it because I, th- I think that's, that's what makes the difference. Yeah. I thought it might be this long, slow distance stuff too. doing more stuff in zone two mm. or this like kind mm-hmm. of lower heart rate, but just long jogs in that way. Like I, I tend to on my training runs, just go like zone four, just go as almost as hard as I can oh, yeah. for whatever distance it is. Um, and have this high heart rate stuff. And I think that might be hindering my yeah ability to acclimate to this super long stuff over 20 miles. Anything you ever read about running will say like 80 to 90% of your work should be in zone two. Yeah. And for or me, else you do go backwards. Yeah. Like your, your aerobic, your aerobic system does not develop. Yeah. I'm a, a big zone two guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I need to chill out there more. Yeah. Well, for me, it seems like I'm going so for that. Yeah, I mean, exactly. we were in zone two for a good 10 hours yeah. or 13, <laughs> however long that was. Yeah. Yeah. When you're out that long, you have to be, I mean, that's the point of doing all that training in zone two is like, you just can't, you can't go over that or else you're, you're toast for this. Yeah, totally. Stuff. Yeah. And I'm doing that. I'm toasting myself. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, enough about running maybe for the moment. Why don't you tell me a little bit more about yourself since I, you know, since we've only met these few times. Um, there's a lot about you I don't know and about your, your, your history and what you've done for work and what you're doing now and everything. Um, give me the, the 30 second version or the, yeah, <laughs> or I the mean, five minute version if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Connecticut. I was actually born in Portland. My mom's family's from Portland. I was born here, moved to Connecticut for my dad's job when I was about six months old. My dad was a pilot, so he was flying for international paper, which was 
I don't know if the company was based in Portland, but the flight department was because there's all the logging and paper mills out here. But um, they moved him to New York when I was a baby. So I grew up in Connecticut. Was that uh, like a private airline for them or they're not flying paper around? No, flying executives around. So yeah. corporate pilot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My brother actually does the same thing now. He's Phil Knight's pilot. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Which is uh, How funny. A, a good pilot job to have in Oregon. His plane sits a lot, I think. I always see it in the hangar, so... Oh, really? That could be... Or maybe not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, better, he's got like... a couple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he has, I believe, three planes, and yeah. those things aren't cheap. Um, but yeah, he has five pilots, three planes, something like that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's what happens when you have that much money. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I have to call an Uber, you know? But, <laughs> no, so yeah, I grew up in Connecticut. I went to school at Bates College in Maine, ended up... After school, I worked for a rubber chemicals company and it was basically Dunder Mifflin from the office. You know, it was, it was that just that same scene. I showed up in a suit and tie to work every day. Doing sales like that? I was doing, I was filling customer orders. So I was, you know, entering orders, answering the phone, taking faxes. We had a fax machine that I had to walk over to every couple hours to check for orders that would get faxed to the office or answer the phone. I really don't think orders were coming in via email at the time. We had email, but it was underutilized. Mm. So I would take orders via fax or phone, enter them into our computer, get bags of things like um, things called Morfax or Adrite Stalite X or Chlorobutyl 1066 shipped to uh, rubber manufacturers that were mostly in Ohio. And yeah, so I was doing that for like a year and a half and getting pretty bored. And I had a friend at the time who uh, was going to college in Montana. He was about to graduate and he was like, hey, I'm hiking the Pacific Crest Trail when I get out of school. And I was like, what is that? He was like, it's a trail that goes from Mexico to Canada. I was like, can people do that? He was like, yeah, people can do that. I'm going to do it. And I was like, okay, I'll go with you. Wow. And so we called our buddy Mike who was, you know, another good friend of ours. And we're like, hey, we're hiking the Pacific Crest Trail when Tim graduates. He was like, can people do that? (laughs) We're like, yeah, I guess so. And he's like, okay, I'll go with you. So uh, the next year we all hiked the PCT starting in April from Mexico to Canada, took five months. And that was, that was a life-changing experience. Did you say five months? Five months. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I'm just like taking in this whole story (laughs) too, thinking through it. Yeah. And so after that, um, you know, having walked through all of California and Oregon and Washington, I was not about to go back to Connecticut. So moved to San Francisco. I started working for Mountain Hardware, the outdoor apparel and gear company. They were still, they had just been acquired by Columbia, but were still operating mostly as an independent company in the Bay Area, mm. just outside of Berkeley. So worked for them for a couple of years. After doing that for a couple of years, um, also dealer dealer service type stuff, getting order shipped, taking care of uh, wholesale customers, that sort of thing. Um, decided to go back to business school. I started business school in Montana. Realized there wasn't much business there. I wanted to go somewhere where I could still climb and ski and do all the stuff I was into. But after a semester, I transferred to Portland, Portland State, where you know I had family in Portland, um, a lot of history here, and I've been here ever since. That was. 15 years ago that I started that now. Wow. Graduated business school, continued my career in the outdoor gear industry. So I worked for companies like uh, The Climb, which was an online retailer of closeout gear. It was a flash sales site when flash sales was big in like the early 2010s. I worked for Columbia. I worked for Icebreaker. Eventually had two kids. Oh, I I should mention I met my wife while I was in business school. We got married. Here in Portland. Here in Portland, yes. Eventually we had two kids um, and, you know, family demands got bigger. And so I decided to stop working and I've been home with the kids ever since. So probably close to five years now. Five years of that. Oh, awesome. So you're an expert at it then. I think I can get some good uh, I, questions from you I don't know if I point. can claim that, but I certainly <laughs> try. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know if you can ever claim expert status in the parenting realm. That's true. That's true. Maybe not expert parenting, but at least you, <laughs> you've got more experience at staying at home and taking care of the kids and trying to balance that out with your own life and how to how to do good as a parent that way. Sure. Hopefully. It's a skill set for You're sure. A few years ahead of me, at least. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's been an interesting thing for me, too, as I quit work back in at the end of last year Mm -hmm. and it's been 
nine months now, 10 months, um, of figuring out that kind of flow between uh, being a good dad, taking care of my kid, and, you know, still trying to do something on my own. Yeah, well, it seems like you're doing a good job. Like we were just talking and you have a lot of things going on. And I think that's, uh, for me, that's been the key is to always be moving forward in my own pursuits while making sure my priority is the family, but to be moving forward in other directions at all times. Otherwise, I mean, you could go crazy. Um, And so, yeah, to always be learning something or or working on something has been, has been critical for me. Yeah. Just for, I think, I think, you know, my mental health, but also my effectiveness at home, you know, doing, doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You have to come to it refreshed and energized. And you said your kids are both now in grade school. They are. Yeah. First and third grade. Yeah. So what about before that time, preschool time and stuff like this, the stuff I'm mm-hmm. in now, were they at home the whole time or did you have them go into preschool and stuff then too? Or what, how'd you manage they that? They did go to preschool, but then COVID happened. Yeah. So there was, yeah, there were many years where kids were just home. Um, you know, when I, when I decided to stop working, my youngest was nine months old, I think. So she was home for a year and a half, something like that until she went to preschool. And then I'm trying to remember where COVID landed within all of that, but there were kids home for years. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's challenging. It, it, takes a lot of your time and energy. Yeah. Yeah. I've struggled with that a little bit in the last year of like, uh, like I could on any day keep him home. And I've done this occasionally and Uh and we go to the science museum or we do something or, or he just sits around here while I work on something like he could do that. And like, what is a better value to his, is it better for him to sit around and be with me and watch TV or, you know, or is it better to be in school around the kids or the, you know, trying to figure that out of like, am I abandoning him at school or am I being a better dad by, you know, giving him this kind of socialization thing? Yeah. I think school's great. I mean, I, I don't know, just speaking personally, my kids love school. They thrive there. Having other, other kids around is fantastic. And I I do think after the COVID years, you know, um, we all needed, (laughs) <laughs> we all need time with other people other than just our insular family. Um, it's interesting. My youngest, it's it's hard for her to get the inertia to leave the house because she, you know, her, her youngest years, she mm-hmm. was in the house with us all the time and mm. not many other people. So, so some days she wants me to promise her, you know, it'll be a Saturday morning. She wants me to promise her we're not going to leave the house all day. Wow. I'm like, I'm not going to promise you that. Oh, so it wasn't just leaving the house for school. It was more, I just like being home. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Interesting impact. That's what she's used this to. This pandemic could have, yeah. Yeah. yeah more, more homebodies. Like we have a lot of homebody behavior already, I yeah, think, in, yeah, yeah. in like the modern, you know, connected and internet-fueled society, right, where there's a lot of people in the basement, maybe. But yeah, could be even more. Totally. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of parents learned during that time that it's... um it's pretty challenging to get something of your own done. Try to be productive. Try to get something accomplished while, while still parenting or being in the room with your kids. You know, you can kind of do both things, but you're not doing either thing well, right? Um, your attention split and you kind of feel at the end of the day like, man, I did a half-ass job on the thing I was working on and my kid's mad at me or something. Mm. I don't know. At least at least for my family, it works where I'm more focused on the kids and my wife is more focused on work and we just kind of split up the tasks that way. Yeah. But we're, we're fortunate that we can make that work. So I've done a lot of these podcasts focusing on the idea of success and uh-huh. personal success and what does it really mean? So this is one example where it could come in. Like, how will you know if you've been successful at being a dad or, or both... You can think about it in that in the moment of how do you know you're doing it this week, mm-hmm. ver- and then will you, how, looking back, how do you know like for the last couple of years or a couple of years in the future, you know that you've get a thumbs up, you know, yeah. you've done good. Man, that's a big question. I mean, <laughs> I, I think we bring our own biases to that, right? Like we have we have our own ideas of what success will look like for our children, so helping them along that path. 
I think if we feel we're doing that, then we can feel successful in parenting. For me, you know, I, I want my kids to be happy, well-adjusted people who are kind to other people. That's like the biggest thing for me. So I guess when I see them doing that, I feel small moments of success. When I see them not doing that, which definitely happens, I feel like there's work to be done. <laughs> um, and yeah, all we can all we can really do is is try our best. You know, success is a tricky thing. I don't know if we ever really arrive places. We can look at other people and think that they're successful, and then we can ask those people what they think, and it might be very different. They might not feel like they've arrived. So I think the best we can do is act intentionally and work with intention toward the things that we want. And then through that, just have the feeling that you've been true to your goal, been true to yourself in working hard that way. Yeah. And then translating that into just like, yeah, a, a comfortability that I've done what I can do. Exactly. Yeah. You know, to intentionally give something your best effort, to know you're not um, in, in my case, my priority is to take care of the family, you know, to make sure I cook dinner every night, not forget to do that, to make sure I'm there for my kids when they are going through something at school or need extra emotional support, to be in tune with that and kind of make sure I'm checking in and just being attuned to their needs. Mm. Which made me think of your uh, adventure van. That, oh, right. that you guys built during pandemic times or so you told me. Yeah. Were you kind of responsible for then for like designing that, figuring out what it would be like making it for your family and their needs or how did that go in your relationship? Yeah, I had, I had been van curious for years. I think it started when I was working for Mountain Hardware, all the, in this was uh, the first, I actually worked for Mountain Hardware twice. The first time I was working for Mountain Hardware was between 2004 five and 2008 ish. And all the sales reps had vans, you know, they had, they would, they would travel their territories in sprinter vans. They would have all the sales samples in there, but they would also have like a sleeping platform because they were on the road all the time. So they would sleep in their vans. They had all their sales samples, but then they would go fishing or climbing or living the lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. It was the first yeah. time I had seen it. It was before van life. It was before YouTube was even a thing. Um, so it was before the van life YouTube trend was a thing. And I thought that was pretty cool. By the time I had a family, we were pretty curious about would an adventure van be a good way for us to, because once you have kids, you're not getting out as much, right? Like, mm. um, for me, it was dramatic, uh, just not getting out as much at all. And I wanted to be so a van seemed like a good solution. We actually rented one in, um, we did a van trip with a rented van from Palm Springs through Death Valley over to Red Rocks outside of Las Vegas uh, when the kids were young. And that was kind of like our test. Mm -hmm. And after that trip, I was like, yeah, a van would be sweet. COVID happened. We ended up quarantining in a motel for Christmas in 2020. So we did Christmas morning in a motel room with Starbucks takeout for <laughs> Christmas breakfast. Wicked. Long story. But uh, after we got home from that, we just, we just pulled the trigger on the van. You know, we didn't want to, didn't want to have to spend another Christmas in a motel room or kind of not have control of, of where we were staying. And a van kind of seemed to solve that problem as well as the, uh, not getting out camping and exploring as much anymore problem. Mm -hmm. So had it on order within a few weeks of that experience. Yeah. And then was that tough to kid out or how did you do that? Like design to know like, Oh, this is how it would be good for my family or this is what's going to be good to use. Yeah. We found an outfitter in Vancouver, Washington, that their niche in van builds was kind of a family adventure type build. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of vans you'll see are built out by Winnebago and they're, they're built out almost like, I sometimes call it like an airplane interior. You know, there's a tiny bathroom with an actual door and kind of like nice seats with maybe some overhead lighting. And it's, it's, meant more to be like a comfortable traveling environment or a traveling hotel room. We wanted our van to really be like modular. Like we can throw dirty mountain bikes in there. If we want, we can mm -hmm. throw all our skis in there for ski season. So our, our layout's pretty empty, but we have enough sleeping berths for four people. So my wife and I have a kind of queen bed size platform that we sleep on and the kids have hanging cots. They hang right above us in these little cots. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, we can all fit in the back there pretty comfortably. Yeah. The kids are super comfortable in there. What do you do about potty time for the kids then? Oh, we've got a little cassette toilet. We've just got like a little, um, you know, a little van toilet. So Uh, just pull that out and they do it right there in the van. Turn the fan on as high as it'll go. Light a match, you know, if you need to. It's, uh, yeah. (laughs) yeah. I haven't used one of those Uh Uh, personally afterwards, you know, does it close up and you don't mind it? it? it Or does the whole van stink for a a long time? No, it closes up. It's got like a little, like you flush it by pulling out this handle that opens a flap and pumps some water in there and then you close it. So there's a tank where all this stuff is and there's these, it looks like a laundry detergent packet yeah that you put in there of toilet chemicals that helps to oh break i thought it would be like a down. dry thing or something but yeah that's yeah. interesting so it still has a, a tank and a thing you're yeah and it's the gnarliest van it. chore is emptying the tank you know you have to find like a camp toilet or you know a place to do it. a place yeah, to a empty place. the tank yeah yeah sometimes it's our house it's gross well, maybe, <laughs> oh, that's the worst yeah <laughs> yeah we used to have a utility sink now we don't even have that so it'd be, it'd yeah. be real rough But yeah, I mean, the van, speaking of success, you know, that was definitely a successful move toward getting the family outside more. Like we're camping in it all the time. We take road trips to Orcas Island. We drive to Colorado to visit the kid's grandmother. We're in it all ski season. You know, we can stay up at the ski hill. Yeah. We can, we can cook soup in there. If the kids get cold during a ski day, it's, it's been great. What are the other benefits of that size versus... Are you at all regretful you don't have the larger um No, because room. of access. We we can we can fit in a regular campsite. You know, you don't need an R V site with a van. Um I put all season tires on it so we can it's still a cargo van. You know, it's still like an Amazon delivery van. It's not four wheel drive, but we can we've driven down some pretty gnarly dirt roads and mm. not gotten stuck. Um we've driven through th- through some snow and not gotten stuck. So was that an option? Like can you can you pay an extra 20 grand or something and it's four wheel drive or is it those kind of vans don't come with it? You can get a sprinter. Um, oh, you have to upgrade to a whole different yeah, yeah, level it, of van. It though. costs a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we went with the, with the pro master it's cheaper. It's front wheel drive. So it's pretty good. Yeah. I used to drive front wheel drive like my first 30 years of life or something. Yeah. <laughs> that was fine. I got through tons of snowstorms. Totally. And all kinds of problems. Yeah. So yeah, I guess you just got to not be scared. Yeah. People, Hype up four wheel drive. I think a lot more than it uh, than it really does. Yeah, like when we went went around Mount Hood, you know, you're able to just park in a normal parking spot. Th- that parking lot was empty pretty much when we were there. You could have parked anything, I suppose, but still seems a lot easier just to pull that van in and take a regular parking spot. Oh yeah, it's great. Um, I mean, you know, not to rub it in, but you were curled up in a Tesla while I was like stretching and <laughs> making myself coffee. I and... was very comfy in the back. Except <laughs> when I had to get changed. Yeah. You can't stand up. But, but lying down and sleeping in there, I was, I was very good. I nice. had, had it in camping mode as air conditioned, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, the van's great for things like that. <laughs> Showing up at a trailhead and having, yeah. having your own space and, um, yeah, it'd be fun to have. We're, um, so we're having another, uh, kid soon. We're very excited about that. Only a couple more weeks to go. Maybe by the time this is out. Yeah. Congrats. We'll be here. So we've been thinking about like how we're going to, as our family expands, how we're we going to fit in the cars or how we're we going to make yeah. that stuff easier. We kind of wanted to get a minivan or we've been throwing out different things. And then this was one of the other ideas that I thought was is good in a way is like get a second or a third vehicle. That's this, um, adventure van or, you know, how do you, yeah. How do you guys manage that? Or what's your day to day driving? Like, yeah. I mean, I, I drive the kids to school every day. So we've got the family car that, you know, is an old Subaru and we're allowed to trash that one. And that's the daily driver. My wife has a car that she does not drive anymore ever since, uh, working from home became the dominant mode of, of work. She's a uh, working home all the time. Pretty yeah. Much now. Yeah. She works at, she works from home. Although she, we live in Portland and her company's based in Austin, but yeah, she, she has a car that I tried to sell when used car prices got sky high yeah. in 2021, yeah. 22, something like that. I was looking at the numbers. I was like, man, this car is worth a ton. All of a sudden tried to sell it, had it priced really high, got a couple nibbles, but no one bought it. And then a tree branch fell on the roof oh, in wow. a snowstorm. Um, it was that snowstorm we had in like April or yeah, I, um, that was a very traumatic snowstorm for me. That's a long story, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember that one. Yeah. Tree branch fell on the roof, dented the top, and then oh. I lost. I lost my motivation to keep to keep trying. So we still have that. We bust, have too many cars. Still in busted condition. 
I mean, yeah, the roof is dented. You yeah. know, it's it's totally fine. It's as, it's aesthetic, but oh, okay. So um, she could drive it if oh, around yeah. town, or yeah, like yeah. You, so yeah, but you just, just don't end up using it. Selling it, it or, made selling it and getting top dollar less. Yeah, you know, not possible. Yeah, so. less possible. <laughs> yeah. So do, what, do you pull out the van then just for sp- for special occasions, or are you ever just running that around town for like picking kids up or yeah? And stuff? I thought that we would be using the van for like annual week long road trips and not much more. And I was very wrong about that. Mm. You know, we definitely go camping for the weekend far more often now because it's less work to get out the door and it's more worth it to go camping somewhere for a night. Yeah. You know, if all our stuff is already in the van, we've got a fridge that's plugged in that has food in it a lot of the time. We've got a drawer that serves as a pantry where our olive oil, our vinegar, our peanut butter. We've got all our gear for the summer under the bed platform. So we can just hop in and go. Mm. We're using it on weekends a lot more. Um, I drive the kids around to town like during the winter if they have ballet lessons for two hours. I'll take the van so that I can sit up on the bed, read a book, make myself tea um, and hang out in there. While they're in whatever activities they're doing for a couple hours. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I have a toilet in there. So it's just, it's, it's true. Yeah. It's far more, <laughs> far more comfortable. Close by. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I do use it around town. It's not, it's not like a daily driver thing, but it's super useful. Hmm. Um, there was, there was a time that <laughs> this is a sad story, but um, we had a dog when we got the van. He's uh, no longer with us, but he was pretty sick. He was old and he was, sick when we got the van and the first night I spent in there was actually at the emergency vet with him. Um, oh wow. Yeah, we tried driving to Colorado like the day we got it and he the dog ended up being not okay to stay home alone, which we didn't realize until we got to Pendleton. Had to turn around to take care of him. I had to take him to the emergency vet that night and um I don't know if you have much experience with emergency vets, but you can stay there for eight, nine hours. You have no Just idea waiting. how long it's going to take. So the van's really good for those situations wow. also. Yeah. Where was the dog then? With you or in inside? He, he in the was, cave? yeah. Well, he he rode in the van to the vet with me, but yeah, yeah he was inside while I was waiting. But yeah. um, it was through the night, you know, I, I slept out in the parking lot until he was ready to come home. But wow. Yeah. Handy. Good for those situations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. It seems like a neat vehicle to have or a um, really handy kind of thing that it's interesting or my wife likes to do you know go rent a house and bend or stuff like that which has gotten super expensive yeah in the last couple of years or another covid side effect or something uh, maybe just the real estate down there yeah um, and whatever it is it's it's tougher totally and um, you don't really know what you're going to get every time you rent an Airbnb, right? Like there's always, I always have a little anxiety. Like, is this place going to be any good? Is it going to be weird? Like, how does it compare to the pictures? Mm. What's the, I don't know the area at all. Hmm. What do you do? Do you miss out on anything when you do a similar kind of trip or these quick weekend thing? By not staying somewhere else, maybe a little bit of comfort, you know, four people in a van is still four people in a van. Yeah. Um, or when the weather's rough or when, something, how are you, when the, you're when stuck the, in the van or what do you guys do? Yeah, you're on top of each other. Um, you know, you can always leave, <laughs> but um, the van's better than being in a tent when the weather's rough. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, we've got an awning we can pull out, so we can still pull out a big awning, put our chairs outside, cook outside. Um, we can get out a little bit, but, you know, when it's not winter, it's pretty dry out here. We live out west. So. And you know what? Maybe the best part of the question is it's easy to imagine what the adults do or like how you feel about it. Yeah. But it's tougher to know like how the kids will react and whether they like it or how you've dealt with that. Like, are there times they're just totally over it or do you just stick them on an iPad or what's the different methods for saying, you know, this is going to fu- be fun kids. Let's do yeah. I, I don't know. They love it. I, I think, I think by just doing it since they were pretty young, yeah. they're so used to it. I think we've done a good job of instilling a spirit of adventure in them by taking them different places. And the van's always just been a part of that, you know, for them, if we're getting in the van and going somewhere new, it's, it's exciting. Uh, that being said, yes, they're going to sit next to each other in their seat and fight half the time. Um, if they're in the mood to fight half the time, mm. I, I don't know if there's any way around that. <laughs> um, That's just the kids thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I, I couldn't recommend it more if you're thinking about how do we make sure to still be active and have options with two kids. It's it's worked really well for us. Hmm. Cool. All right. Well, I'll, I'm, my wife will probably hear this hopefully. And oh, yeah. She'll, yeah, she'll I, I, I can what, help give looks, her the yeah. pitch. You know, just let me know. <laughs> All right. Have her give me a call anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Why don't we switch topics to something? Uh, how about... You can tell me more about the the big hike, the five months of sure, of, yeah, uh, of trail life. That was a fairly long time ago at this point. It was. Was it already part of your lifestyle? The whole you know being outdoors, hiking, camping, like, or was that kind of your big introduction to? I'm gonna have this as my a, a core thing for me. Kind of the latter. Growing up in Connecticut is very different from growing up out west. There's not much of a culture around an outdoor lifestyle, or at least there wasn't when I was there. What were your parents into? Sometimes maybe that's one of the key reasons you do it or don't do it. Right. Do they, like my dad used to take me on camping trips each year. Once, yeah. You know, not a huge amount we were doing it, but we got a little bit in all the time. Totally. And so, so yes, I was exposed to camping. We did take some camping trips when I was a kid and, um, Connecticut's beautiful. You know, there's good hiking. I grew up playing in the woods for sure. I was outside all the time. But in terms of hiking, I don't think I had ever gone more than eight miles in a single day before before going to hike the PCT, mm. which, you know, on day one, you got to cover 20 miles. I had led like an outdoor orientation trip at my college senior year. So that that was a really great experience. And after doing that, I knew I wanted more. We led a group of incoming freshmen on a I want to say probably a three-day hike, backpacking trip. Didn't cover a ton of miles. And that was near the, I believe it was the Franconia Ridge area in New Hampshire. It's a really beautiful area in the White Mountains of New Hampshire in the summer. And it was it was awesome. So that was a little taste. Um, you know, I was into skiing and snowboarding growing up. So I always had, the outdoors was always a part of my life, but nothing epic like that. No big mountain stuff, you know. On the Pacific Crest Trail, when we hit Mount San Jacinto, which is a peak that's about 9,000 feet above Palm Springs and a really intense mountain, that was like the first big mountain I had ever encountered. And we immediately got lost, suckered into a canyon, got <laughs> got suckered into a very uh, intense situation up there. So it was kind of trial by fire on the PCT. Wow. What does that mean, intense situation? Oh, you want to know the story? Yeah, briefly. <laughs> but one thing to think of is like just the timing. Like, yeah, we didn't have the phone or the GPS. Yeah. Music. You might have had some GPS with you or how were you no. on this kind of like yeah, it was safety two, orientation? It was stuff. 2005. I mean, we we had had cell phones before starting the hike, but we turned them off and left them at home. You know, smartphones hadn't been invented. These were, they weren't and, even And charging them, you know, yeah. like you're going to be out there for a long time. You don't have power around. They weren't easy solar cells you could flap out exactly yeah. yeah there was and probably no service along the whole thing yeah so leaving it home it made sense left the cell phones at home there were still pay phones at the time so you bring enough quarters um you can call had, your family when there you was need some to. satellite stuff then like iridium phone or whatever. you know like there was some weird sure. stuff did they have any like survive nowadays you can get a tiny little satellite thing that can ping for emergency beacons yeah but i don't know if that would existed then i certainly didn't know about them yeah yeah, with Mount San Jacinto, I mean, we were we were probably less than two weeks in to the whole adventure, which is an interesting time because we had walked, I think that's like mile 150-ish. So we had walked 150 miles. We were a couple weeks into a big hike. We were starting to feel like we lived in the mountains. So we had this hubris, right? But we really weren't that far along in this thing. We did not have any mountain experience. We went up Mount San Jacinto when the at a time on a really heavy snow year when the trail was covered in snow and we quickly lost the trail and then it felt like weather was coming in that afternoon. So there were clouds coming in, it was getting colder, it was late in the day. And we could see we were with another person. As I mentioned, I hiked with two of my good buddies from growing up. And we were we were with a fourth person that day who had hiked the whole thing a couple of years before. So he had a bit of experience. And hiked the whole thing, this particular segment or the whole? The whole trail, the whole PCT. PCT. Yeah, two years prior. And so he was like, 
we could see I-10 below us, which is the highway that goes out to Palm Springs. And we could see these towns we were trying to get to below us off the north side of the mountain. Looked really close. Well, the north side of the mountain is a 7,000 foot drop down to the valley floor. And it's incredibly steep. And you should not go down that way. But we decided to go down that way because we felt this weather coming in, couldn't find the trail, and it looked like it was a quick escape route. So we went down this canyon down the north side of the mountain, made very slow progress that night, ended up just sleeping on rocks in a canyon, woke up the next morning, started trying to keep moving down the canyon. We were moving maybe 100 yards an hour through just thick alder and rocks, loose scree. Canyon walls are getting steeper and steeper, and there's a stream through the middle of the canyon. And we could hear, eventually we could hear that the stream's turning into a waterfall down below <laughs> us. And, and it's incredibly steep. Like we can tell there's no way out. Hey, yeah. You don't have ropes or anything either. Right? This is not a, that yeah. kind of trip. Yeah. But I noticed there's a hose in the stream. There's like a rubber hose in the stream. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. I wonder what that is. Like is some town down there pulling their water from the mountain via this hose? You know, keep an eye on that situation. We keep moving. And then I notice up on the canyon wall, like a sprinkler, just watering rock. We're like, what is that? So we scramble up the, you know, the west wall of the canyon to check out this sprinkler. And it's watering little cannabis plants all over the canyon wall. (laughs) And we're just like, oh, shit. (laughs) This is very not good because we don't want to be seen up here by whoever's watering these cannabis plants. But also, they must have some way to get up here. So we put our cameras in our backpacks, like put that stuff away, start looking around, and we find a little trail that goes up over the canyon, way down over a couple ridges, passes an abandoned camp with like just trashed sleeping bags and rusty stoves and all this stuff. And eventually, miles later, links back up with the PCT, finally find the trail like late afternoon, get back down to the valley floor by the evening and just, you know, pass out in the dirt. Yeah, it was a very sketchy experience. It sounds like that show Ozark in a way, like you stumble the wrong field and don't get, yes, don't get hurt from again, right? I think we're very fortunate that nothing (laughs) dark happened. Yeah, thank Um, goodness. There's a new book actually called The Trail of the Lost, which is about It's a, you know, like a true story that follows three missing persons cases of people who disappeared off the PCT all between like 2015 and 2017. Half the book is spent searching the exact area where we got lost for, for a particular hiker. So like reading that book, I was freaking out just like, oh my God, there are so many parallels between what happened to us. Yeah. And what happened to this person? A person who hiked the year we hiked in 2005 got lost further east on the same mountain um, in a different canyon on the north side. He he wasn't lucky, as lucky as we were to make it out alive. For unknown reasons or, is, or uh, wet I, he, weather stuff? Same thing happened to us. I mean, yeah. same, same thing that happened to us. He, he went, he didn't know where he was. He went down a canyon. He was older. And he he died in the canyon. They mm. found him a year later. Yeah, it's really surprisingly dangerous. Of course, walking or people die on Mount Hood every year. Uh, yeah, going trying to go to the peak or just getting stuck in the weather. Yes. So that story aside, that happened yeah. two weeks in. The rest of the trail was uh, a lot smoother. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think um, we you know we cut our teeth in the mountains on the first big mountain we encountered. We uh, got a little smarter after that experience. We yeah, what going. was the difference? How did you how did you get smarter? Is it uh, just <laughs> being more careful about the trail and when you're on it and off it, or what? what yeah, do do? I mean, it's humbling when when you have a when you have a really close call. You know, it's humbling. You learn to respect the environment and you're in in a new way and uh, be a little more careful. But yeah, we were 23 years old, so yeah, we had a lot of youthful hubris to to start with and. You know, the Sierras, when we, by the time we got to the high Sierras, again, it was a big snow year. So there wasn't much trail at all up there either, but we took the navigating and the decision-making and the not doing something stupid a little more seriously by the time we were in bigger mountains and uh, knew what could happen if we made a wrong move. So yeah, the next four and a half months 
were okay. No major problems. Were you more scared of animals or people during during this time? That's a really good question. I would say in general, I was not really afraid of either for most of the time, although there were moments. There's a town in Northern California called Etna, and it's just a tiny mountain town that the trail goes through. We went off trail and we took like a rest day in Etna. And everyone in town is going, oh, watch out. There's mountain lions in those hills. You know, you got to be careful up there. And we're like, we've been living up here for four months now or a couple months, however long it had been by the time we got to Etna. We had seen mountain lion tracks multiple times. We knew they were up there. We thought they were overreacting. And anyway, we get back on the trail that afternoon to keep hiking. And immediately within probably the first mile, I see mountain lion tracks. I'm like, oh, they're not joking. There really are mountain Definitely lions here. up here. Don't think too much of it because, again, it's it's not uncommon to see mountain lion tracks. That night, we uh, run into some southbounders. So those are people hiking from Canada to Mexico. And um, Etna is kind of like when you start crossing those folks. We sit down. We have dinner with these people, exchange stories, et cetera, get to chatting. Dinner turns into kind of sun's going down. It's time for bed. So my buddies and our new friends, they all set up their stuff out on this uh, nice bluff overlooking a valley out in the open. There's not enough space for me. So I just take my sleeping bag into the woods between some trees and I set up my stuff, go to sleep. I wake up in the middle of the night to this sound, just like footsteps just circling me. I'm just like, oh crap, what is that? I hear just just like keeps going around and around. And I just picture this big cat just circling me. So I want to scare it away. Right. So I'm like, ah, start yelling. Thing keeps circling me. I can hear the leaves crunching. I'm like, ah, yelling louder, still circling. It's getting closer, like tighter and tighter. Eventually I'm just like, ah, yelling as loud as I can wake everybody up. I hear my buddy Tim go, Brett. I'm like, yeah. It's like, turn your headlamp on. It'll go away. And I picture myself turning a headlamp on and a cat just like jumping on me and (laughs) slashing my throat. I'm like, I don't think that's such a good idea, man. It's like, do it. The deer were bothering me too. And I'm like, oh, yeah, deer. I turn my headlamp on. There's a deer right there. (laughs) He's trying to lick my face. Whoa. Yeah, they're, they're they're salt starved. Wow. So, yeah. The thing, and the thing kept bothering me all night. Just, what? Yeah. They'll, wow. they'll steal your trekking poles. Just to get poles. a little bit of perspiration out yeah. here. Basically. Yeah. Your trekking poles? What do they yeah, want those, those for? Because they're covered in salt. Like the, the foam or cork handles just like absorb all your sweat. Wow. They can sniff out this yep. little bit of salt. Yep. There That's was insane. a, so um, there was a guy, you know, trail names are a thing on the PCT. People start adopting these. It's like a stage name. Okay. There was a guy whose trail name was Buck Larceny because his pole got stolen by a deer. <laughs> so yeah, I was very afraid of animals that night. Huh. And there was, I don't know if people still do this, but we were hitchhiking a lot. You hitchhike when you cross a road. If there's a town down that road you want to get to, to resupply or take a break, you hitchhike to town hmm. and then you hitchhike back to the trail to keep going. Um, there was one, you asked if we were afraid of people, there was one guy who gave us a ride who seemed very sketchy, just like got, got serial killer vibes from this guy, you know, that was the one time, like I had my hand on my pocket knife. That was one of the things I was going to ask is, um, about what you carry on these trips. You could talk about your food and your different supplies, but also this protection thing, like, Mm -hmm. you know, against uh, a mountain lion or all these kind of things. Do you have a gun or some kind of scent spray, anything you do? uh, Yeah. What, and that you have to carry with you for five months and all this. So yeah. How do you, how do you manage that defense? In terms of that? I mean, you know, we use this technique on the Timberline trail a couple of weeks ago when you have five guys running together and you have poles and lights and you're kind of loud. I don't think a mountain lion's going to mess with you. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I do think that strength in numbers is is a very good protection against animals. Every bear I ran into on the trail ran away like as fast as it could. You know, there's no grizzly bears on the PCT aside from, they say there's four grizzly bears in the North Cascades in Washington. Hmm. We didn't see any of the four. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of black bears, but they're, they're afraid of you. 
we did, this was probably a false comfort, but through the mountains, uh, we carried ice axes, you know, for self arrest in case you fall down an icy cool yard, you know, you can self arrest with an ice axe. I often slept with that near my head just in case, you know, I don't know what I was going to do with it. If a bear is going to come attack me in my sleeping bag, I don't know what I could do with an ice axe against <laughs> it, but it gives you a little bit of comfort to know you have a weapon like thing. A oh, claw. Yeah. Yes. You've got one claw to go against their One big uh, ten, claw. Huh? Yeah. And yeah, we had pocket knives, but, um, we didn't carry bear spray. We were supposed to carry bear canisters for our food through Northern California. And we did not, we never hung our food. We, our, our main thing was we did not sleep where we cooked. So we would usually cook dinner around six o'clock and we would hike five more miles after dinner and just kind of sleep next to our food bag mm. and never had any other than the mountain fake mountain lion story I just told you, um, no close calls at night. So yeah. good stories. Thank you for, yeah. for sharing these. <laughs> and then what about the resupply stuff? How often do you do that? And what's like, I was thinking of it when you were on your Canyon story, I thought maybe it was going to lead to that. Like you get stuck in there and you only have a day of food oh, left yeah. or, you know, yeah. How often are you restocking food and water. Yeah, we were able to resupply probably on average every five days. Mm -hmm. You know, the trail's always crossing some road where you can get to a town um, that'll have something. You know, a lot of the resupply places are not, you know, it's not Whole Foods. Um, you're often resupplying in some weird like fishing lodge that has... It's like a convenience store kind of thing? Yes, there was some convenience store resupplies, but like sometimes even worse. Like just some, like a fishing resort that sells mostly lures, but also has like a little bit of food. Yeah. You know, sometimes three boxes of little things, exactly. a little bit of candy. Or, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes you're resupplying at a place like that, but that, that, that was the exception. Um, usually, what do you do in a situation like that? Do you say like, eh, let's just do it again tomorrow. Like, let's just get through get yeah, a little bit. I mean, or do you really try to get like, oh, I'm going to take 50 bags of Twizzlers. Or, you if know. you know, you're not going to hit another road for three days, you get as much as you can. And you know, so you check your map and yeah, consider. And you're, you're rationing and you're eating candy and weird stuff for a couple days and you make it work. I wonder if a lot of that's changed as it, you know, as time has gone on, if I would imagine or, it has, yeah. You know, reading this book about the the lost hikers made me realize how different it is now. The Pacific Crest Trail Association gives out, I think, 8,000 permits a year to through hike. And I think when we hiked it, about 300 people started every year. Um, you could start whenever you wanted. You didn't need a permit. Now they assign you a start date. They, you have to apply for a permit and there's thousands of other people starting. Um, so with that, there's more of a market for services, right? And there's yeah. also smartphones like, um, yeah, like you could have some Amazon delivery to a place yes. up ahead and then walk, hike to it or something, right? Yep. Yep. You can do that. I read in the book, there's, there's a cannabis delivery service specifically for PCT hikers. So you can just order joints right to the trail. Wow. Um, you can probably hail a ride instead of, instead of having to do all the hitchhiking. Um, I bet yeah. that doesn't work in every place you go through, but I'm sure you could do it at some of the trailheads. So yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot different, a lot different now. We used to mail, we had a bucket of supplies, like a five gallon bucket that we would mail up the trail to ourselves. So that would have like extra clothes, guidebook pages that we needed for the next sections, but not the ones we were on. Hmm. Um, maybe some extra food, stuff like that. Yeah. Another thing that, a service could do or something, right? Or there's gotta be some guided services. I would bet we did this, um, a few friends of mine, we did, uh, a bike ride on the Monahay trail. It was a four day long mountain bike ride. It was like a hundred miles. You do nice. you know, 25 each day and then camp each night. And we were lucky enough to have a, a service that there was a trailer and they'd haul the trailer site to site each night. So we could have like full gear yeah. and food and all that, you know, a couple coolers and our, um, our tents and everything. We just like load them up in that trailer and then the trailer would move. Well, we'd leave on the bikes. The trailer would move on its own to the next site and we'd, we'd see it there. Nice. Which, yeah, was makes it super easy to, then you just yeah. got your bike, you got your water supply and your, your day pack of food and 
you're good to go. Totally. Yeah. I mean, the PCT has, you know, it's a different ethos, right? There's like the whole supported versus unsupported thing. And the people who are breaking all the fastest known time records, Mm. you know, that's, those are supported efforts. So like you're describing where they have a lot of help getting, getting their calories to them, getting water to them. There's just like boxes pre-prepared or whatever that you just get there and yeah load up your stuff. You don't have to shop or do anything. It's just there at the side of the trail. Exactly. Is, you know, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a, just a different way of doing it. Uh, most through hikers are unsupported. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Self-supported. Yeah. And that's the, yeah, the thing that's in the books and the movies or something, right. Is the uh, totally unsupported and just making your way yep. out in the wilderness. Yep. Yeah. Very exciting. So what'd you do after that? Um, if that was the kind of the kickoff of your outdoorsy lifestyle yeah. in a way, when was the next time you picked that up? Plus? Yeah, that's a good question. First of all, coming coming off of the PCT is an interesting thing. There was definitely like a post hike depression period for me. Like you you have to reintegrate, and it was a thing I didn't expect to happen. I just didn't think of it at all. But after going through that, you know, living in the wilderness for five months, and you know, finishing something that just seemed kind of impossible going back to just like regular life, regular society after that was really hard. Um, and I think that's, that's a common thing. It was, it was mentioned in that, that book I just read and it's interesting. So that happened, got through that, moved to California and well, pause there for a second uh and tell me a little bit about some of the normal life stuff, like the money of doing this trip, like setting up for it, yeah. the normal life you had, you said you were working at that one job for a year and a half or so. Yeah. Had you saved up a little chunk of change? I to, had, to I do was, this? I was living with my parents at home and working oh. at the rubber company and making pretty good money for a college graduate. And I had like zero expenses, yeah. you know, right, right. I was living in my parents' house. I was eating their food. I just had no expenses. So, so. that's a really nice time. So you didn't have a, an apartment then you had to keep paying rent on while no. you're hiking or anything. It was just like, oh yeah, I got this thing, I'll quit my job. Yeah. Perfect time in your life yeah. to try to do this. Exactly. I had, while I was working, I, I was able to buy the gear I needed to do it, which is not much. You know, if you're going to hike for five months, you don't want to bring that much stuff because that makes it harder. So you don't need much saved, you know, a couple thousand dollars, which is all you need for that junky food you eat the whole time. And, uh, you know, the, the odd hotel room to take a break every now and then it's not financially daunting to go do it. Yeah. Especially when you don't have a lot of responsibilities. Yes. So then yes. you were able to come back and you live still back there, your parents then for now, or did you like immediately go out and try to. Yeah, no. So out? my brother lived in Portland at the time. So I stayed with him when I got off the trail. So just stayed with him. I, I don't even remember how long it was. It must not, not have been much longer than a couple of weeks before I drove down to San Francisco San Francisco is not a cheap city. I, yeah, I had friends who lived there. So I was sleeping on their couch until I got a job driving a dump truck, um, which was awesome by the way, (laughs) but got a job driving. It was like a construction dump truck. So I was hauling construction debris down to the landfill a couple times a day. And that was enough. I did that for not too long before getting a job at Mountain Hardware, which was enough to split an apartment with a buddy. Did the PCT trip give you a lot of cred getting those jobs? Or did they, yeah, they, for sure. Probably, they probably like seeing that. Or they, they could tell you were part of the lifestyle. For the yes, <laughs> I, I do think I do think having lived in the mountains, you know, for the previous five months helped me get a job at yeah. Mountain Hardware. Yeah. Um, and yeah, from there, from there, like the outdoor lifestyle just kept branching off in all sorts of directions. I got really into rock climbing when I lived down there. Hmm. Um which, you know, took me to Yosemite and um, areas around California, just climbing, climbing big, awesome mountainous stuff whenever mm. I could. Also got back into skiing and backcountry skiing. And California's got just incredible mountains. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a lot of skills, like you're saying, new things to learn all the time. Yeah. Going back just briefly to the, what you miss getting off the trail too. Is it the the people a lot or is it... Yeah, it, it reminds me of other, you know, like PTSD kind of things or yeah. from, you know, soldiers coming home or different stuff of like this. It's just a totally different world and you don't feel like a part of it. So I can't pretend to know what it's like for a soldier getting home, but I would imagine there are 
some things that are similar. I remember, so during this time when I was feeling that after the PCT, I watched the movie Jarhead and I just, it was so relatable to me. Hmm. I don't even really remember what Jarhead is about anymore, but I believe it speaks to that feeling. It, it's just weird. It's, you go through the last five months just trying to survive every day and, you know, keep walking and get over the next mountain, whatever it is. And then you come back to regular life and everything seems so petty. Just th things that everyone seems to be taking so seriously just seem so unimportant to you. And that just makes you feel like kind of empty. Yeah. It's, it's a weird thing. And it's also missing the people. So like, I remember every night at dinner time, I'd feel this strong urge to call my friends and be like, you eating dinner too? We're, it's dinner time. You guys eating? Like, <laughs> it's just a weird thing. Huh. How, do, how long did it take to get past that or feel like, yeah, it, it didn't it, take it two days or is it two months? Yeah. It didn't take too long for me. I, I remember feeling it mostly when I was in Portland and staying at my brother's house and just like kind of in limbo. I think, I think moving down to San Francisco and like moving forward through those challenges just helped snap me out of it because it was like, Oh, I have to get a job. I have to find an apartment. I have to like learn this new city. That's a whole thing to, to do. So yeah. I, I think that snapped me out of it pretty quickly, <laughs> but it's probably different for everybody. I, I would imagine most people who hike the PCT or any long trail feel, feel that to some extent. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's got to be some sadness too in it just being over. Or mm -hmm. I don't know, there's a bit of a theory on that I've seen play out in, in other people and in my own life too of, you know, if you have an especially good time doing something, whether it's 10 minutes or a day or, you know, like a kid going to an amusement park or something, like often afterwards there's a, a big down spike, right? It could be the actual yeah. the hormones and the transmitters in your brain like are all firing real high as you're having all this excitement and then you know there's a depression as all those things start going away yeah um but there's some correlation it seems like between the time of your good experience and the amount of that that downtime interesting right that yeah if you have these uh weeks months of time that uh they're having a certain experience it takes like a similar time to come down off it sometimes yeah like, or you're going to be depressed if you have a excitement. That makes sense. You know, I think there's also, since the goal, the objective was so big and we had spent a year anticipating even starting it, five more months of, of chipping away at it every day to achieve it and, and never knew if it was actually going to happen. You know, something could happen any day that could, that could just end your hike. And so, so we were so laser focused on the goal and just finishing the thing I don't think, I don't think I ever gave what happened afterward any thought and, you know, and then all of a sudden you're there and you just haven't, the, the thing you've focused all your energy on over the last couple of years is all of a sudden done and you haven't thought about what happens next for a second. Mm. Yeah. No one kind of cares that it's done except you either, right? There's nothing, yes. nothing to show for it. There's nothing, you know, it's yes. just like, oh, I was doing this fun thing for so long and now it's just over. It's so, uh, yep. Yep, it's such a big deal to you, but yeah, obviously no one else cares. You know, I've heard I've heard musicians say they feel a similar thing if they re when they release an album, hmm. right? Like they've worked so hard on an album, they've put it out in the world, and then no one cares. <laughs> I can feel it's the last guy I had on. Uh, well, depending on when this episode comes out, exactly. But uh, my friend Nat Commissar, who's a uh -huh. also a, was in the singing group with me. In that singing group, I definitely felt that after our concerts more so, yeah. I think, right? Like you'd you'd have this intense work for months, uh, selling tickets, preparing the show, you know, learning songs, practicing, um, especially the selling the tickets part. That was like a huge amount of work. Interesting. <laughs> to go, like door to door in dorm rooms, trying to you know, uh -huh. get people to buy stuff. Anyway, then this concert happens. It's a big thing. You got a party afterwards. And then the next day, it's like, it's all done. And those people, you know, they got the enjoyment out of it. There's no album the same way. Like maybe when yeah. you release an album, then you're getting the feedback of people buying it and, you know, the songs, the singles releasing or something. But the mm -hmm. concert felt much more like that for us because it was just a one big event. Yeah. And then afterwards you're, it's time for finals or yeah. it's time, you know, it's yeah. just on to the next thing. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, you have leveled yourself up by going through the process, but yeah, yeah, it can, you can just feel that 
that emptiness of coming off of the the rush of doing it, I suppose. Yeah. Interesting. All right. So maybe changing topics a little bit. Uh-huh. Let's talk a little bit more about your family and how it's set up and how you've kind of grown into that position. So you mentioned how, you know, five years ago you um, decided to step back from working and your wife then has been the the main breadwinner for the mm-hmm. family. Um, how did, how did that come about? How did you kind of um, negotiate that with her? And yeah, what have, what have been the tough parts about doing that and the, and the easy parts? So. Yeah. Well, that came about <laughs> due to circumstances. I was working a sales type job at the time that was commission based and the numbers were not working out. So it was, um, it was a small business with a long lead time type business and commission just wasn't, wasn't coming quickly enough to pay the nanny and make all the work worth it. You know, in a, in a two working parent household, there's, there's a lot of stress that piles up with that setup. And, uh, you know, we were making a little bit off the top uh, after paying the nanny and doing all that stuff, but it wasn't feeling worth the stress. Yeah. So just circumstantially, you know, on paper, it just like my wife's making more money than I am. It just made sense to stop doing it. I don't know. It hasn't made much sense to start doing it again since then, especially when, when COVID happened. That really, for the first couple of years, I had always been thinking of like, oh, I'll go back to work sometime. You know, it was always in the back of my head. And then COVID happened and I just kind of stopped, stopped thinking that that was even possible to, for, for us to both be working. Yeah. Um, Cause the kids were home so much, you know, someone had to be doing all this stuff. And like once COVID happened, like if someone coughed one day, then you had to drop everything, take them like for a two cro- weeks. Yeah, too, yeah. exactly. <laughs> like it was just like, you couldn't just you couldn't be okay with, I don't know. It was just different. You know, that was kind of a rambling answer, but no, that's good. Yeah. Is there anything special about it, about being a man in that position that you felt? Yeah. I mean, I think there's some unique challenges. Like we live still in a very gendered society, right? I'm grateful to live in a place like Portland where, um, people aren't as, obsessed with maintaining like more traditional gender norms, but we still live in a very gendered society. Like when I drop my kids off at school, I'm one of a couple men dropping their kids off at school and it's, it's mostly women. Mm. I do think it might be a little lonelier as a man who's like the domestic partner. You know, the, the challenges are cultural for sure. When you say lonelier, do you mean yeah, because you're not part of that community of uh, other moms or something. Or do you mean, like, I also find this to be a lonelier living than than working at my, at yes. my corporate job in the past, right? Like, I just don't see many people. Yes, it's probably both of those things, right? Like, it's definitely lonelier being the one at home because you don't see other grownups. Yeah. Like, you can go days without seeing other grownups if you don't intentionally build that into your life. And then I do think that if you're not, part of a community of moms, it's, it's just harder for dads to make those connections, you know, for better or worse. That's, that's just how it is. Yeah. Any good solutions you found or good tricks for, for getting through that? Well, like I said, I, I do have to intentionally build like kind of communities of grownups into my life. So, so I do a Monday songwriting class with other grownups. Mm. <laughs> um, I play music with some friends of mine on a different night. You know, I, I run and I occasionally run with people like you and and other people I've met through that. So, and that was through a relay team, which is a community based running event. So yeah, I I think, and you know, in middle age, it's harder to make friends than it is when you're younger. Like it's no secret that middle-aged men are a very lonely group and it's kind of an epidemic. So for me, I have to understand that and, and do things that put me in contact with other people. Yeah. Um, and it's not always easy. You know, I'm not like the most extroverted person in the world. Like I like to, I like to stay home and play my bass and kind of get lost in my own little world sometimes, but I need to get out and see other people. And yeah, that's, it's definitely a challenge of being the stay at home parent. Hmm. Yeah. I guess I found in these different stages of my life of meeting friends of trying to do that, that just being involved in some community often, helps tremendously, right? Gets you, gets you, you know, me doing more of this, the running stuff and, you know, meeting you and other people like you like that 
it's just from doing a lot of running and going to, totally <laughs> and then you know putting in the effort to go try to call people or or meet up with groups or go to things um and the more you do it the more it seems to give give rewards generally totally yeah and i think for people for people like us who are at home a lot of the time you know have you heard of this idea of the third place yeah i have heard that term i don't remember exactly what it means yeah there's there's work there's family you know those are like the first two places and mm. then there's the third place well i don't have work so i have family that's just one place you kind of need a third place right and the church has traditionally filled that role in a lot of people's lives but I don't go to church. Um, it hasn't been a part of my life since I was a kid. And I think that's the same for a lot of people. I think a lot of people in our society are getting away from the church, which is, you know, fine. But we need to, the church, the church filled a societal need for that third place. It was a place where every week you got together with people who had similar interests, but might have been different from you. And, you know, you're coming together um, and working toward something that's bigger than you. And yeah. I, I think you need to find those other third places in your life, especially if, if you're not working and you don't live like a religious lifestyle, then, then what else is it that can kind of help you fill that need? Hmm. I, I think that's, it's a big idea that people should be thinking about as a social need. It's hmm. also maybe a business opportunity. If you can think of, um, a business it's like idea. a pub, I think. Is yes, it? a pub <laughs> is one, yeah. sure. But yeah. like, I, I think, um, especially as we live more online lives too, right? It can be harder to overcome the inertia of scrolling through your phone, you know, uh, living in your online communities that, that creates a lot of inertia to not leave your house and not yeah. actually, you know, look other people in the eye and um, commune with other people in real life. So yeah, very interesting. Yeah. One feeling I've dealt with or th thought about, and I'm interested to hear your perspective. This could be getting too personal too. Yeah. Feel free to bail out. Sure. Um, but is like whether you ever feel like your wife resents you for it or mm. how you deal with that money stuff or like when you want to buy something or spend money, like do you feel like yeah. you don't deserve it or it's not yours or yeah, how, how do you deal with those issues? In yeah, relation? that's challenging. I mean, I, I think trust is key in any marriage and relationship, trust and communication, right? So like we definitely have to communicate all of those feelings if they arise. I don't think my wife resents me for staying home. We talk about those things. She's, she's always been more career focused than I am. So we're fortunate in that. But that being said, work wears her out like anyone else, right? So like, yeah, it's freaking hard for her to be the one that has to go to work every day. She does want a break. She would love it if I was the one that was working sometimes. So it's, you know, it's something that's a, an ongoing conversation. Um, it's not something that's out of the question that I would be the one working at some point. The challenge is her market value is by now quite a bit more than mine because she hasn't stopped working. Mm. You know, she's still progressing in her career. So yeah, it's, it's something to navigate the money. You know, we trust each other with money, the money we treat as ours. Like when you're doing the domestic work, like I do a lot of the work. It's true. I'm yeah. earning half of the family's money or whatever it is. Yeah. That's work that needs to be done. Taking care of the kids, taking care of, frankly, taking care of my wife, taking care of the family, making sure everything's running smoothly. So I do feel like I deserve to um, to spend Be some part of, of the money yeah. she earns from <laughs> just time like the to kids time. get to, yeah, to yeah. spend. Yeah, but you know, I don't go nuts. You know, any big purchases, a family should have their way of of discussing those. And do you kind of have like a mental dollar amount? That's yeah, like maybe under or over? there might be some mental dollar yeah. amount. I find I don't. Know I definitely think is. I. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I don't have an exact amount, but I do find even the small purchases seem to add up they to a lot up. at the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't know. How the math works and all that sometimes. Consumerism, mm. man. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know. Budgeting. I gotta, yeah. I, have, I need to get more into that too of, uh, you know, setting some kind of family budget or or doing, uh, 
some way we have all all of a good view of the finances and yeah and keep track of it and, and, and have a, a thing where a goal we're trying to meet yeah that that's definitely been part of my job as the stay at home partner as well you know I go back and forth on the budgeting when when we need to be budgeting more I'm budgeting pretty hard when we don't need to be budgeting as much I'm kind of lax about it but it's definitely my responsibility to keep an eye on our finances and, you know, bring up any financial things that need to be brought up. Um, a big one right now is saving for college, Oof. setting the right amount, you know, setting up the deposits to happen for what I think is the right amount. And that's a, that's a tricky thing. Are your kids in public school or private school here? In They're Portland? in public school. Yeah. Yeah. That's the private school is like as much as college. Yeah. Right here, a lot of it. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> there's some, not, not there's paying problems. for that. Yeah. <laughs> Saving um, for college seems tricky enough. So yeah, exactly. That's what yeah. I'm like, how can we do both? Uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Uh, yeah, got a couple more years at least. Yeah, luckily, you know, I'm pretty handy with Excel spreadsheets, having having been in um, merchandising for years. So <laughs> <laughs> keep track. I can handle some light finance. Nice. Yeah. Um, so maybe let's switch over to a couple of different questions. Uh, one thing I like to ask people about is like how AI influences their job or how they see it in in the future, right? Like how is uh, all the modern developments that have happened this year, um, shaping their particular career. Yeah. So yeah. What do you think that is for you? Have you been using it in any ways currently and are, yeah. What do you see happening? Yeah. Well, I don't think of myself as really having a career right now, but I, I definitely work on music a lot in my spare time and AI has been a really interesting disruptive force in music. I've dabbled with it for writing lyrics and I think it's terrible. Mm, um, really? Yeah. Lyrics are cut. Kind of, oh, this is an interesting thing I uh-huh. care about personally too. But lyrics are in songs are often like kind of garbage, yes. right? Like they don't so lyrics, mean anything or they're, you know, yeah. Lyrics not, are not even a good terrible, poem. right? Yeah. So that might be part of the problem. I mean, maybe when you, so when you read the lyrics, they're just bad. And here's uh, the thing. Like, yeah. That'd be, be good. That'd be a great song. Cause yeah. <laughs> lyrics are bad. The point of art is to express oneself, right? Yeah. So you can't have AI express yourself for you. I, I think the only the only lyrics I can write that seem good to me are ones that feel honest. Like if I'm like honestly expressing something, if someone else hears them, hears my lyrics, they're going to think they're garbage, possibly. Possibly they relate to something. Mm. But it's really hard to outsource self-expression to AI. Um, unless, unless you give it really specific prompts, maybe if I had, uh, I, I guess I'd have to plan ahead or maybe do this for other episodes in a way I would have the computer ready to go here and then we could try and do it together. Yeah. <laughs> we could right. Write a song <laughs> live. Well, here's yeah. a more, here's a more effective use. I've asked AI sound design questions, right? So like, how do I make a synth patch to mimic the bass sound in a Giorgio Moroder song from the seventies. And it'll give me really good ideas. Yeah. Like it'll just, you know, program the filter like this. this, Yeah. And so you can just, you can just plug in what it says and you can get pretty darn close to the sound you're wanting to emulate or something like that. It's awesome at helping with stuff like that with like every program and different things. I saw someone doing that with uh, camera filters too, or like how to, how to edit a a photo. I want it to look like a certain thing. What, what specific values should I use? And it's like, it's giving a range of the things you should do. Yeah. Um, Or I personally was using it with, um, I was laying out my new book and like doing the uh, InDesign stuff. I think it's InDesign, Mm -hmm. whatever the Adobe tool. And I've never used it before. And I just was able to like, ask chat GPT a few questions guiding me through like, Oh, where do I find this kind of tool? How do I do this? Or how do I, you know? Yeah. And it gives you a nice little tutorial as if like better than the fact page from Adobe or something. Totally. Right? And and it's personalized to you and you can, yeah, it's really amazing at helping you speed up the learning new tools. Yeah. And in terms of like my, my main responsibility, which is domestic work, I, you know, I haven't even thought of how AI will affect that. You know, like uh, like we were just talking about, part of my responsibility is is keeping track of our finances, and of course, AI can do can do that stuff, no problem. I'm sure. Yeah, I haven't seen a good personal finance tool yet that is assisted with this. Like I've used Mint.com or those things in the right. past, where you you can just get a view of all your spending. Yeah, give me the boutique financial planner. Yeah, AI. Like take that. Okay, you got all the info on uh-huh. where the money is and where it's going. What should I do but, now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you tell me some deep insights about that. Exactly. That That's got to be out there. Yeah. 
that's probably already everything you think of and search on this business. It's someone's already made a website and <laughs> has yep. a thing going usually. Yeah. But they started two months ago. It's just, is it any good? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that could be a fun thing to look for. Yeah. What about the kids schooling? I guess I think about that a lot of how it's going to impact like your kids. She said first and third grade. Yeah. Still pretty young. Yeah. Like they're not really writing papers in third grade. Yeah. Maybe we were, maybe we like, uh, that might have been when I wrote a report on Michigan or some of these like really basic, you, know, you had to do a little bit of research and write a small page of text. Maybe that was more fourth grade. Uh huh. But it's a real soon. Yeah. She's, and something that chat GPT obviously has zero, like it, it's way better. It's almost, it's too good at doing that. Right? Totally. <laughs> I mean, the assignments just need to change, right? The, yeah. the assignment can't be write a paper anymore because anyone can write a paper with, on anything with the tools, you know, with AI. With, yeah, you so just like, write, tell me about Michigan. Exactly. And then you take what it has and send it in like that. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to read it. You just do it. Yeah. So, and if that's how research is done now, then. What is that next level task that we should teach them? Yeah. I mean, they need to learn to use the AI tools, how they work, what they do. Like, I just think, you know, I think the things that, the things that they need to be learning have just changed. It's a little bit scary because I don't understand the world that they are going to be adults in. You yeah. Know, I have no idea what it's going to be like. So that's what I'm trying to think about a lot, or that's kind of my classic uh, job role and, and where my mind likes to go being that kind of futurist yeah. kind of thing. Um, so that's why I like talking to people about it is to hear everybody's different perspective and that helps kind of perceive where everything could be. Yeah. Going. Interesting. Uh, but so thank you for sharing some of your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, it was been really fun talking to you. Cool. And, uh, I think we had some great stories there. Thanks for sharing your, your fun PCT trail moments of and everything. Course. Thanks for having me. This was fun. All right. See you soon. Yeah. That's it for today. Thanks a ton for listening and don't forget to like, and subscribe. I hope you learned something and I'll see you again next time. Friends.